Good evening, everybody. It's uh, David Nekrutman, Executive Director for Ortara Stone Center for Jewish Christian Understanding Cooperation. Thank you from everyone from every part of the world, including Canada. Ray, you're representing Canada today, all right? Uh, we even have a Goodwill Ambassador that we, this uh, a group of uh, people that we took in 2011 to Israel. So Scott, it's good to see you, Pastor Scott. Uh, the, what you're seeing on the screen right now is um, a program that took five years of prayer to come to fruition uh, last year. And we took uh, Christian professors who taught Bible, theology, uh, early church history, and even preaching uh, to Israel. And so I said to you, that was like, like a real prayer and, and a dream come true. These are the people that came from, uh, from all over, all walks of life, all different denominations within Christianity, mostly within the main line. And this is some of the, uh, the schools, uh, the colleges and the seminaries that uh, were part of our, uh, our Christian academic program. So the reason why that happened was um, when I was attending Old Roberts University, taking a master's in biblical literature, uh, in 2014, I had a, uh, a class and in the book of Romans. So as the Orthodox Jew, who, the first Orthodox Jew to attend a spirit-filled university, uh, I, was I was learning the book of Romans, and I was learning it from a pretty much a replacement theology point of view. Uh, we were learning N.T. Wright and some commentaries. And at that point in time, I would say to you, in all honesty, my Christian Zionist bubble burst. So I was always taught, uh, since I... I entered into the calling of Jewish Christian relations that there are 70 million evangelicals in the United States, Bible believing Christians, all of Israel, 650 million worldwide. And as a, as a Jew and the Jews only rep represent only 16 million in the world. When you hear 650 million people, you're like, wow, we're okay. We're good. Then you enter into the, the world of academia and you're on a very much pro Israel campus. And you're starting to learn things that you would think would have changed in the classroom. And so, the, so God put into my heart to come up with a, an idea that hopefully we'll be able to uh, change the conversation in the classroom where one can actually see Israel, the modern day Israel unfolding and walking in its past history and seeing that going through Israel, through Jewish sovereignty that you can see that the Bible is coming alive. And that type of point of view should also be considered in the classroom. So that was in 2014. And literally last year, uh, we had our two, first two missions of, of Christian academics coming to Israel. Now, part of, part of, the, uh, part of the, them visiting was also going and visiting them. And the last place I literally visited was Beeson University in Alabama. That was my last place I went to. I went to Asbury as well. That was in February. Uh, but we wanted to bring uh, the top archaeologists and top academics in Israel and bring them onto the Christian campuses to introduce the, the conversation. Then, literally, a, few, a couple of weeks ago, this headliner comes in that says... The veracity of Second Kings of the, about the that the uh, the city of Jerusalem was burnt was verified by the person who's going to present today, Dr. Yuval Gadot and his team. Now, normally, when you hear dates of 586 BCE that the uh, temple was destroyed, uh, if you are in the world of academia, you know, give or take a few years. But when you hear that, no, it is the exact date that took place, what we would call Tisha B'Av, on the ninth day of the Hebrew month of Av, all of a sudden, it piqued my interest. Uh, so immediately, I had uh, Limor Riskin, who is uh, the Director of Operations for the Center for Jewish Christian Understanding and Cooperation, contact Dr. Yuval Gadot, and he was so gracious to come aboard and present today this amazing archaeomagnetic dating of understanding that literally the date that we celebrate Tisha B'Av, the ninth day of Av, which is a very tragic day in Jewish history. First temple, second temple, 
we we basically put all tragedies on that day or around that day. But to hear that the first temple was destroyed was just amazing that it happened on that day. And they have proof from science, just not that proves the Bible. On top of that, two hours ago, you should just know the Jerusalem Post put an article out quoting Dr. Gadot of saying that there was also a return of Jews back to the city. Now, most of us think that the, uh, the, old, the, the original, uh, the original uh, ancient city of Jerusalem is within the walls of Jerusalem itself. But uh, Dr. Godot will tell you, no, it's actually the city of David, which is the ancient city of Jerusalem. So Dr. Yuval Godot is part of Tel Aviv University's Department of Archaeology. And he's been part of the digs that are happening at the city of David for years. So it's my honor to introduce Dr. Yuval Godot. Thank you, Thank you very much. Well, that's a, a warm uh, welcome. Uh, so I'm excited to sit here in uh, my house at uh, Modi'in, not far away from the airport, and to speak with people from across the world. Uh, COVID uh, brought uh, a lot of misery, but th this is at least something good that came out of that, the fact that we can communicate uh, like that, and we, I can share with you our work, uh, which I which I, I always understood to have, that should be kind of, it should go out of the kind of the professional field of archaeology. David, you showed me before some of the pictures that I think you didn't share at the end with others, and I saw there uh, both Gabi Barkay and uh, Ronnie Reich, I think I also saw his yeah, picture. Yeah, I saw Ronnie Reich, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, we always wish and, and want people to, to appreciate what we, what we find and to see, to communicate it with other people because as, as you'll see also towards the end, one and one is always more than, more than two. Uh, so by communicating to people that are dealing with other things like theology, Bible studies and so on, I can, I can earn understandings that, I, that sometimes I'm kind of limited with my knowledge uh, of having. Uh, so I'm, I'm very grateful for this opportunity. And uh, we will be going through a journey that towards the end of the journey, towards the end of the hour, we will get to this thing of the archaeomagnetic, uh, uh, ancient uh, archaeomagnetic field uh, of the earth and how we connected uh, with it in, in our field work and, and the destruction. And if I don't talk, talk too much, then we'll get to, to speak also a few minutes about things that happened after the destruction of Jerusalem. But I want to take you kind of um, in order to, to see for you to be able to appreciate the actual find, I want to take you through a journey of understanding what is this, this, this idea of the city of David and why Jerusalem being excavated for 100 and something years is still a big mystery for us archeologists. Uh, so uh, it, will, it will be kind of a, a tour around. For the archeologists, Jerusalem is, is an enigma. Okay, it's not an enigma because the lack of knowledge it's more of an enigma because of the, the uh, 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 amount of knowledge that we have coming from different fields, uh, which is sometimes contradicting and sometimes it goes hand, hand in hand. Uh, but it's, it's not an easy archaeological site uh, to, to understand. Okay? On the one hand, we are excavating there, we, the archaeological community, for over 150 years. We have tons of uh, archaeological uh, textual sources that we can relate to. And I, I placed here on the, on the image two, uh, two of the more kind of, let's say, moments of the, the, the Jerusalem is mentioned in text. On the left hand, you see a, a figurine of a captured person on it, written in Egyptian, in ancient Egyptian, curses against somebody. So this is the kind of a, a voodoo puppy uh, uh, that was, uh, it's called the execration text. Egyptian kings, somewhere in 1800 BCE, were writing names of places that are outside of their control, and then breaking the, the figurine and hoping that this, like, uh, the spell will be held against these leaders, the leaders of these places. And Jerusalem is one of the cities that is mentioned. And that's the earliest mention of Jerusalem in something that is outside of the biblical text. And then on the right hand, you see a, a pillar that was found in a Roman, uh, a Roman site just outside of Jerusalem. Uh, it's, a, it's a kiln site, a place where they produce pottery. And on that uh, pillar, you see that somebody kind of a graffiti style uh, engraved his name. 
and say that he is from Jerusalem. Okay, so you have a, a, per, a person and the, the name of Jerusalem on it. Uh, and this is, this is coming from the late Romans, so early Romans, sorry. So this is, brings us to uh, the beginning of the uh, common era, uh, the first century C. So you have two examples. So what you would think that with all this information, we should be knowing a lot about Jerusalem. But actually, on the other hand, we are still missing key finds from periods that the, the, the text is describing in very many details. Everybody is aware of the debate over the, the, the status of Solomon and David as kings, whether the kingdom was big or, or small and so on. But these are very early times. If you go to the Persian period, the Hellenistic period, just before the Hasmonean kings, we hear many more details about Jerusalem, but actually, actually in the archeology, span we find almost nothing from these periods. So the, the conflict and the, and the puzzle is much bigger than just a, a single period and a single question. Especially when you come to things that before this person has, uh, Herod, uh, built Jerusalem, rebuilt Jerusalem, anything that was built before him was kind of cut down to the ground and, uh, and has disappeared. So when you deal with archeology span and you want to go through this veil that Herod has placed over the city, the amount, uh, the, you know, the building of the, the first temple, the second temple uh, and so on, it's very, very hard to find uh, things from this period. It's also connected to one thing that may, may sound kind of, uh, uh, why am I saying that when we talk about uh, Jerusalem today with its image? Uh, archaeologists are always, uh, they, we need, I don't know how to say that politely, but we need destruction moments. Because when people simply leave their house and somebody come and resettle there, or the house is slowly decaying and falling down, almost, no, almost nothing stays at the site. But when a site is destroyed in fire and everything is frozen in time, like the Titanic sinking, then this is a golden moment and a golden opportunity for us as archaeologists. You see here pictures from the destruction of Canaanite Hatzor, excavated by Arnold Bento from the Hebrew University, and then the, the poor person lying in the destruction of Azekai is an excavation that I'm co-directing uh, at the site by the Valley of Elah. Uh, and these are like moments that we, th this is a lab moment for archaeologists, and we, and we, we kind of, we don't want to find the, these things, but we do, okay? We, we, are, we nourish on, on moments like that. This is when archaeology becomes really, really relevant, and we can, we can unfold things like a crime scene. We can slowly understand how everybody lived and what happened when they, uh, when they died. Jerusalem is missing destructions in archaeology, okay? And this is, this is what I meant by saying it's a little bit puzzling. The, Jerusalem has this image of a city of wars coming back and forward. But actually, I dug as a student at Tel Megiddo, and now I'm digging at Azekah and other places. There are like, let's say Megiddo, there are something like uh, 10 destruction layers over the centuries at the site. Jerusalem has one, which is the Babylonian destruction, which I'm going to share with you uh, the image of. And uh, even that I'm, I'm calling half, okay? I'm not sure that it's a wholesale destruction of the city, but we'll come to it later. And the Roman destruction of Jerusalem in the, seven, in the year 70 CE, when Jerusalem was completely burned down by the Romans. Except for that, nothing else. Okay, so Jerusalem is missing destruction moments or layers. Maybe there were destructions and war, but they didn't leave their mark in the archeology. span And so for us as archeologists to unfold the story of the city of how it evolved slowly from its destruction in 586 BC and until 70 CE when the Roman destroyed it, it's very hard. We have, we have to kind of find this kind of small and minute evidence here and there for the Persian city, for the early Hellenistic city and so on. Uh, in, what comes around is that we are still very busy in our archeology span with questions that are very basic, okay? What is the size and the nature of the city in every period that it existed? Well, where is the location of the ancient core? Unlike, maybe I should have emphasized it even more, unlike Tel Megiddo, Tel Achish, Azekah now, Echazor, where the archeologist is coming and he has an empty lot of land and he can say, okay, I wanna dig here, here, and here. And this will give me an, an, kind of, an overall picture of the city. When, when explorers came to Jerusalem and the city of David, where we're going in a minute, it's, it was already covered or partly covered by buildings. So they didn't really have the choice sometimes. They, they dug where they could, 
they wanted to dig in other places, but they couldn't. Uh, so the, the data is accumulating over the centuries. And what the earlier generation knew uh, is nothing compared to what Gabi Bakay and Oni Reich knew. And my generation can build on the data that was gained by the excavations of the early generations, the Callisters and so on, Kenyon, Shiloh, and then Gabi Bakay, Oni Reich, uh, and so on. So we are kind of privileged already to collect many dots and connect them together. Uh, and this is part of what we'll, I'll be talking about today. And David, you mentioned the uh, 9th of Ab. One of the moments that is leading towards where we want to go, and I'll emphasize today, is the story uh, of the destruction of Jerusalem by uh, the Babylonians. Uh, it's written very clearly in the Book of Kings, as you can see here. I, I will not know, go now and read it. Uh, it's also uh, described by the Babylonians themselves, so we can connect the Babylonian dynasties and the biblical text and come to a very specific year, 586 BCE. Uh, uh, we, we, this is like a, an anchor and you see how we are going to be using this anchor later on. So what I'll do after this kind of short introduction, I'm sorry for one second, I need to move. Yeah. Uh, I will speak a little bit of how about how the city looked like in this 8th, 7th century, just before it was destroyed. And then I'll share with you the evidence for the destruction as we found it. And as, I, as I'll try to, and it also depends on your patient, I will speak about the revival of Jerusalem and how the memory of the destruction has pre prevailed to our days through material culture, of course. But in order to do that, I need to introduce some terms. Uh, if you want to ask questions, I didn't say that before, if you want to ask questions, I kind of moved you away so I can see the presentation, but write to me in the chat and I'll stop at one point, or David, maybe you can, can point out that there are questions and I, I will relate to them. And yeah, leave people I'm gonna leave answer. the questions tor towards the end. Okay, okay. so the, the, what we, I'll, I'll start with few ge geographical terms, which are very, very crucial for our understanding. And the first thing is the Gijon Spring. The Gihon Spring is located within the Valley of Kidron. Uh, and this is the source, this is the reason why people came to settle by Jerusalem. There is no other spring like that anywhere in the highlands of Jerusalem. There are many, many springs, but none of them has so much water and it's kind of a, a stable and uh, gives water throughout the year uh, that you can kind of uh, build a city around it. And uh, so it's the, the reason why people come to sit there. It's, I'm sure it was a spiritual center because water in the land of Israel is, uh, should be understood as a God gift. Uh, it became also the political center of Jerusalem uh, because it's like when you, when you have oil, this is what you protect. And when you have uh, water, uh, this is what you protect. And this is what you use in order to establish your power uh, over the region, because now when you're in control of the water, you can decide who gets to get to, get to use the water and who doesn't, okay? And the Gijon, we'll come back to it later on. This is the, an image that kind of tries to explain the topography uh, of the city. The Gijon spring is where the number four is, but the number four is here for the uh, Kidron Valley. And you saw it here in the, in the image, in the drawing before, the Kidron Valley is very deep. The, the drawing is from the 19th century, but you have to imagine it is even much deeper. It's almost like a, like a gorge in, in a sense in the topography of Israel. Nothing is really dramatic in Israel, but still uh, it's very deep and it cuts through and separates between Temple Mount. And now ignore the temple itself. Think of it as a mountain without the temple on it. And then you have the, 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 the peak of the mountain is located here where the temple actually was built. And Temple Mount is an artificial creation by Herod that kind of uh, square the mountain. But it was around the mountain like any other mountain around. So you have the Temple Mount here. And on the other side of the Kidon, you have the Olive, um, the Olive Mountain, uh, Mount Olive. Uh, and the two of them are separated, as I said, by the Kidron. Then I'm jumping over five to, to six, and six is the uh, Gei Ben Inom, the Valley of uh, Inom. And this is another river that connects together with uh, uh, Kid the Kidron at this point here, in, in this kind of uh, pointing, meeting point. And all of that area here is Mount Zion. 
So it's another mountain peak. And separating between Mount Zion and Temple Mount is something that is not visible today to the visitors because of the uh, amount of building operations that happened in Jerusalem. It completely disappeared from the landscape. But anybody who built in Jerusalem until the late Roman period, until the second century CE, had to take into account this very, very deep valley that cuts through and separates between Mount Zion and Temple Mount. And it's, uh, the name of it is uh, the Teropoeon Valley or the Central Valley. It depends on which name you, you prefer. Josephus Flavius was calling it the Theropeon Valley, the Valley of the Cheesemakers, which it doesn't really make sense. Maybe, as Ronnie Eich suggested, it was called the Valley of the People from Tyre. And because of the, the kind of mistakes in Greek, it was uh, somehow interpreted as the Cheesemakers. The Theropeon for us is enough, I think. Uh, and the Theropeon is uh, also meeting with the, uh, uh, with the, the Kidron at this point here. And then you have this narrow ridge, which I think you can see it also here even much better. This is a model that was made by Conrad Schick uh, in the 19th century. He began to collect information and then kind of drew off the natural topography of Jerusalem. And it's amazingly accurate. You know, the city was there. You can see here in lines the, the walls of Yerushalayim Atika, the, uh, like all Jerusalem today. But as you can understand from what I said at, until now, that's not ancient Jerusalem. Okay, so this is the, the walls of the, the, that were built by the Ottomans. This is Temple Mount as a mountain. This is Mount Zion, Gay uh, Beninon. Maybe I'll use, so you'll be able to see me even better. I think this is, oh, this is too small, wait. Let me uh, laser point. Yeah, now you can see my pointer better. Mount Zion, Gay Beninon is located here. And the Kidron is located here. And this valley, which is very, very deep, uh, and as I said, has disappeared completely from the landscape today, this is the Theropeon, okay? And when we say the city of David Ridge, it's this very, very narrow ridge, okay? Which on one hand, you fall into the Kidron, to the west, you fall into the Theropeon Valley. That's the entire story. And the spring is located here. If it wasn't for the spring, the city was probably would have developed on the mountain here, on the mountain here, on other mountains, anywhere. But because they wanted to settle by the spring, the city of David Ridge became the ancient core of, of Jerusalem and where it, uh, it evolved to and where it contracted to when the city was hit in a few times. Okay, so Temple Mount, the city of David Ridge, Mount Zion, the Western Hill also sometimes, and so on. Let me take you through a video see how I do that. I need to go out of that. Uh, we are now flying and the houses that you see are built on the, the city of David Ridge. You can see this is like what something like uh, 50 meters, 100 meters at the most and now we are beginning to hover over the Kidron. On the other side you see the village or the, today the neighborhood of, uh, of Silwan. And now we are really above the Kidron. We are just leaving the area of the spring itself. And we are uh, seeing the, the slopes of the city of David, the slopes of Silwan, the Kidron in the middle. And I wanted you to see this point. You see here the orchard. This is the point where the Terpeon meets together with the, with the Valley of Kidron. And uh, this is the point where the water was transferred uh, by either Hezekiah or Menashe, it doesn't matter, somewhere in the 7th century BCE uh, or the end of the 8th century BCE. And since the, the, one, the moment the water were transferred to a pool here underground, and I hope some of you got to walk there, uh, then for people wanting to be in Jerusalem or to build Jerusalem, the water source is at the pool. Now we are seeing Mount Zion and the road where the car are driving uh, underneath it is the Teropeon Valley, okay? And above now you see the Jewish quarter and so on. So you understand that you're located outside of the, of the old city in an area that topographically is not very easy. Let's stop that and we are going, okay? The spring, the source of everything, and then people settling by the spring, it means that they're settling on the ridge of the city of David and its eastern slopes. And anybody dealing with ancient, uh, the story of Jerusalem will always tell you that until one moment, the city was always at the city of David Ridge, but then it expanded northward towards Temple Mount and westward. 
okay, westward uh, towards uh, Mount Zion. The move westward happened somewhere in the 8th century or maybe even early 9th century, in the days of the Judean kings. And this is a very, very important move uh, that together with that, they also kind of, they disconnected themselves from the necessity to live by the spring. They brought water from other places, but uh, they also moved the water from the spring itself. Let's do that again. The laser. Uh, to the pool, the pool which is located here. Uh, this move uh, was dramatic. For the st first time, the city moved from, let's say, 100 uh, dunams, 10 hectares, uh, to 800 dunams, 80 hectares, which is incredibly much, much la larger. It was fortified, massively fortified. Uh, some will say for the first time, some argue that it was maybe fortified before, but definitely the, from this moment onward, it's fortified. There is an administrative system that goes together with the stamping of jars handles. Okay, this is a jar that says on its handle, belonging to the king, la melech. La melech means belonging to the king. Uh, and then it has a symbol and names of places. The jar was stamped when it was still wet before it was burnt. And then the content of the jar belonged to the tax organization of the kings. Uh, and you see bulleas that had names of officials and so on, elite residents. Jerusalem from that moment when it's expanding, it's becoming a, a real, let's say, a matured kinghood with officials that are working for it, with the bureaucratic systems, with efficient tax collecting and so on. It's also happening with the time that Jerusalem is coming under the yoke of the empires. Uh, the Assyrians are stepping in. The kingdom of Jew Israel was destroyed completely. But Judah is cooperating at the beginning, at least, with the Assyrian order. Then Hezekiah rebels, uh, but a few minutes afterward, a minute, days, years, uh, his son Manasseh uh, is becoming again a client, a client of the Assyrian uh, Empire, and Jerusalem is flourishing under the uh, this Assyrian order, Pax Assyriata, uh, as some may call it. Okay, this is to give you an impression of how much, how larger the city is. This is the city of David Ridge. That's the core where it began. And you have Temple Mount here. And all of that area was added to the city and fortified uh, by the days of Hezekiah and then his son Menasseh. So this is an incredible leap forward. Uh, and the richness of the city, is, you can see it everywhere. I, I placed here two pictures of uh, stone made uh, capitals. Uh, these kind of or or ornamented stone capitals are known from a uh, ninth century, uh, the kingdom of Israel from, from the north, from places like Samaria, Megiddo, Hazor, the royal centers of the Israelite kingdom. Then they disappear for a while and they reappear in the seventh century in the landscape of Jerusalem, in Jerusalem itself, the, the stone capital above, uh, and in the landscape around Jerusalem at the site called Ramat Rachel, which I participated in its excavations, and we can find a time and talk about Ramat Rachel if you want one day. Uh, Eleven such stone capitals were found. Uh, this capital that I placed here was found in a spring by the Rephaim Valley, uh, something like five kilometers in, uh, southwest of the city itself. Uh, and this is like saying, the spring belongs to, to the king or to the kingdom, uh, in a sense, placing something like that uh, by the spring. And uh, David has mentioned some news media outflash. This is a news media that came out by the Israeli Antiquity Authority, but it's an incredible site that belongs to that period. You can see that it's like, what, the 22nd of July, uh, by the American embassy, uh, not related to the embassy, it's outside of it, because they're, they're building their neighborhood. Uh, they found a huge site that has to do with the administration of agriculture in the landscape around Jerusalem. And it's not just, you know, then it's not just the shelters. It seems like there is lots of, I would call it royal propaganda uh, in the way the place is shaped uh, and uh, functions. I wanted to relate these moments, these glorious moments of Jerusalem to the 50 years that uh, King Menasseh has ruled over Jerusalem. The biblical text uh, portrays him as the, the the most evil king, uh, and uh, he is being blamed for the dis final destruction of Jerusalem at 586. But he ruled for over 50 years, 
according to Divrei uh, Yamim, the book of, uh, I forgot the name in English now, sorry, uh, but according to one source, he was taken as a prisoner to the kingdom of Assyria and sat there and kind of wanted to go, go back, come back to, uh, to Judah. Uh, it makes sense that he, he was in Assyria. I don't know if as a prisoner or this is kind of uh, 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 trying to make him a little bit more, uh, even more, more vicious than he was really. Uh, but it seems that the kingdom of, under his rule, the fact that he cooperated with the Assyrians, uh, that he became a client in an order. And I didn't use the term before Pax Assyriaca just in, by coincidence. The Romans has established a system, and everybody is, knows that, where if you cooperate with the empire, you gain to have a lot of profit from that. But if you rebel, then you'll be punished and, and suffer. And it seems that the Assyrians had this model way before the Romans, and whoever cooperated with their world, whoever played along with their interests, uh, flourished, and Menasseh has probably uh, has been a good client to the Assyrians. Uh, and he's being blamed in the biblical text for uh, whatever he's being blamed to on, because of theology, not related to political uh, acts and so on. Uh, and now I'll take you closer to uh, the excavations that we are conducting at Givati, and you'll see what do, what do I mean by Jerusalem flourishing in these days? Okay, and this is a picture that gives you another impression. This is the city of David Ridge, and you see Temple Mount here, and the Givati parking lot excavation is this area here. It's the largest exposure of uh, uh, archeology span in the city of David. There are many other excavations, but none of them were so wide, so deep, and also left uncovered, so you can come and see them. Okay, the, in many other places. Yeah, sure. Well, I'm just going to say that the uh, book that you're looking for is Second Chronicles. Chronicles. Yeah, chapter Thank 32, you. Verse, verse 33 to chapter 33, verse 20. That's where you'll find that account. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I always have problems getting the name, the right names in the, from Hebrew to English. Uh, so uh, it, it's not mentioned in the Book of Kings. It's only mentioned in the Book of Chronicles. And... Uh, it, I think it's like, I'm not arguing about his theology. Uh, politically, probably, he's, he played his card right, according to what we see uh, in Jerusalem. So we're going now to this area, Givati parking lot. It's called Givati parking lot uh, because it was a parking lot for uh, a few years. Uh, in 1986, uh, Israeli soldiers that came to be sworn in the Western Wall the, the bus parked at this parking lot and then there was a terrorist attack against them. And since then it's called the Givati uh, parking lot excavations. Uh, sorry, parking lot. And excavations is because it, the entire place was excavated uh, for many years. This is how it looks like, it looked like in the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. Uh, We're talking about the area that is located here. Uh, and you can see that it's also on, only a field. But the field is hiding something like 2,000 years of uh, archaeological uh, remains. And it's also hiding, which is important for us, the fact that there is a river here. But the river is underground, okay? The Teropeon Valley passes just here. Uh, the area became completely flat. But if you would come here in uh, the year 1000 BCE, you would be standing here and overlooking a very deep valley, just as you're standing here and looking at the Kidron. It would have had the same image, okay? There were few excavations because the area was filled up with so much, it, archeologists never really were able to, to attempt to understand this, uh, this site, except for, I think, McAllister, uh, not sorry, not McAllister, Crawford, in the 1920s, in the beginning of the 1930s, uh, he excavated there, but these are old ways of excavating and it's all been backfilled, and you don't really see anything from his excavations, and you can't really connect uh, to what he found. Uh, Kathleen Canyon, we can jump. The guy you see here uh, guiding at the site is Doron ben -Ami, and he began to excavate here in 2006, together with his partner, uh, Yana Chekhanovich, for the Israeli Antiquity Authority, as the salvage excavations. There are plans to build here a visiting center, uh, and the archaeology is a will blend with uh, the visiting center. 
Uh, and his excavations were carried out until 2016, and they found remains from as early as the 9th century BCE, the days of the Judean kings, and all the way up to the Abbasid period, the 10th century CE. And you see here a picture of all these periods in this picture, in the, in the image that you're seeing in front of you. What is important, I'll say differently, in 2016, the Israel Antiquity Authority kind of declared that for the, for the construction, they don't really need to go on excavating. But then we as Tel Aviv University said, look, you've just reached the most important periods, the early Hellenistic, the Persian, and Iron Age uh, layers, uh, but they were never really explored, and we should go on excavating here. And the decision was that it would be a cooperation between the Israel Antiquity Authority, Iftach Shalev, my partner, and uh, Tel Aviv University, which I represent. And we were kind of given a free hand to choose where we want to excavate and what we want to find, and also on how we want to excavate. And this is, you'll see afterwards how important it is. Uh, and we, because we know that one day it's going to be a touristic site, we kind of didn't, we didn't want to dismantle later walls. So we chose two or three probes, and I'm going to take you to this probe here, area 10,000, uh, uh, sorry, area 1,000. Uh, and uh, this is where there weren't any Roman uh, finds and uh, late Hellenistic Hasbonian uh, finds, and we could you know, go deep into the earlier remains. And this is where we began to excavate, and our hope was kind of fulfilled. Since 2016, we were able to find both remains uh, from the uh, early Hellenistic, the Ptolemaic and Seleucid kings, below them the Persian period, and below them the late Iron Age, the, uh, the days of uh, Judah as the biggest king, uh, city in the kingdom of, the, of Jerusalem. And this is where we're going, the Ashtar building uh, in this area. Let's jump on that. It's a little bit technical. Uh, you, you have to understand that we are digging a slope that we don't really see, so it takes time to understand. But this is the top of the ridge here, and these are all remains uh, that are later, and we dug here deep into the valley, and we understand now that we, what we found is a building that was built uh, on a kind of a pre-prepared pre, pre and pre-planned steps. Uh, that were made into the rock. Okay, the rock wasn't sloping in steps, it was probably stopping like that, but then they, whoever came there, and I think we can relate that either to the days of Manasseh or a little bit earlier, and they created a kind of steps and then retaining walls. And this is the deepest step, and this is where we found our building on 100, and it was made of at least two floors, and you'll see later how I know that. It has to do with the archaeomagnetic uh, test that we did there. Uh, the second floor, the one that was least preserved, was probably the more monumental floor. I called it the ballroom. Uh, and I will be taking you through the rooms of this structure. Okay, everything that is in green here, this is where we're going, uh, this structure. And I, instead of showing you the overall picture, I want to try and impress you from, by a few elements. Uh, Sveta, our excavator, is standing here looking at these two stone-made pillars and thinking how, how big they are. This is the beginning, or not the beginning, but this is the one moment in the excavations. But a few weeks later, we understood how large they are. Okay, this, this stick here is a meter long. And you can see two pillars that were cut by one monumental stone, and they are standing at the entrance to one of the rooms. Okay? This is something that we know in the Iron Age, that, is, that people are using in other places, but large stones like that are very rare. So this is a very impressive entrance into the room. Then we see a lot of the use of Ashtar stones. Usually when, when people were building in the Iron Age, they were using uh, field stones that they simply collected and placed in the walls. Ashtar stones are specially cut in the, um, as mercenaries in, in, the, in the quarry and then placed and you have to pre-plan and make sure that they fit each other. And it's not that the entire building is built of Ashtar stones, but at least part of it, or the outer kind of the, the facade of the building is built of these Ashtar stones. Here you see very beautiful decorated architectural elements that we found within the collapse of the building. A stone made sink, um, something that may indicate a window or something like that. 
very rare elements to be found in, in the archaeology of Jerusalem. And we, were, we found them in the collapse. This is the first hint for the grandeur of the second floor, okay? Because the, the second floor, as you'll see in a minute, collapsed into the first floor. We also finding wooden beams, like you see here on the left. This is when you have time to excavate very slowly, you can, you can articulate the beams and they don't just, you know, crush in your hands. And uh, we're going to make a big study of the kind of food that they were using. I know that at least until now, there are no cedar of Lebanon in this building, but still a lot of use of ashlers, of sorry, of uh, wooden beams, probably in order to support the second floor. And the floor that you see here, and you'll see it better in, better in a second, is the floor that collapsed from the second floor down to the basement, to the first floor. And this is an incredible floor, made of plaster, very thick, uh, very beautiful. People that came to visit us, all they always told us, oh, I saw something like that in Caesarea that was made by the Romans. And we told them, listen, it's not Romans and it's not Byzantines. This has to do, it has to date to the Iron Age. And there is no other parallel like that to a floor like that. So sometimes in order to understand the grandeur of the past, you need small hints. And this is one very crucial hint uh, in order to understand uh, the, 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 the function of the building and how it's not a private building. Okay. And now you can see the, the tentative plan that we understand. We have at least three rooms, A, B, and C, that we found. Uh, and the building con continues here, the building continues here, the building continues here. So we don't have the entire layout, but what we have until now is enough. And that's the, the ground floor of the lower floor. There, there was another floor above. And here you can see within our work, we are finding all the time a lot of wood. At the beginning, we thought of everything as connected to the construction of the building. Some of the wood that we are seeing, especially in, in the room C that you'll see in a minute more of it, we are thinking that it's furnitures that were burned down. And burning is very important when we come to speak about the destruction, okay? Here you can see all kinds of things that we're trying now to preserve in order to check what, what they were Originally, wood would never preserve in an environment like Jerusalem if it wasn't burnt. So, and the problem then is that when you take it out, it all crumbles down. So we have to be very, very careful when we're digging these things. Uh, within this destruction, okay, now you see the wooden uh, objects and you see uh, pieces of pottery and you see stones. It means that everything is collapsing down and this is a crushed jar. And on the jar, there is a stamping. And the stamping is a, of, a, of the Judean system of collecting tax. I showed you before the Lamelech stamp impression, but this is a rosette, which is more typical to the end, the, the days that Jerusalem uh, was destroyed. And this was, when we saw that, this was a very clear uh, symbol, uh, sign for us that we are dealing with the destruction of Jerusalem at 586 BC. Whenever a jar like that is found it's, and it's crushed, it's found in the destruction layer of that moment. So all of this burning of the furnitures and the wooden beams, all of the stone collapse, and now the jar, all gives us indication that we are dealing with a house, with, with a building, not a house, that was destroyed in 586 by fire. Okay, and you can see here, these guys working here are working within room B, and the room is full of stones that fell down. And you'll see it in a second. You see here the ashlers and so on. And this is how it looked when we you know, kind of moved all the earth from the stones. The amount of stones here is incredible. And the amount of stones here means that the building uh, had a different, another floor above, and this floor has collapsed down when the building was burned down. Okay, this is how intense the destruction of this building was. And now you see room B, the pottery here, no doubt brings us to uh, 586, together with the jar that you saw before, we were very confident that we know the dating of what we're digging. And this is the assemblage of the room after we, uh, uh, it's called Rapaut in Hebrew, uh, we uh, restored it uh, together. And you see all of these kind of fancy bowls that were probably used in order to share some small food or something like that. And this is how uh, I allowed myself to call it a ballroom uh, that was above. 
Included in the destruction are also some kind of uh, very, very unique objects. Some of them we are still learning, but I want to turn your attention to two of the uh, written uh, objects here. The first is a seal. Okay, this is a private seal held by a person, either on a ring or sometimes tied on his neck. And the seal says, Le'ikar, uh, okay? Le'ikar is this, Ikar means a farmer in Hebrew, but you, you take it as a name, okay? And Le, again, means belonging to. Uh, and then, son of Matanyahu. And if it was Netanyahu, we would probably be on the media. Uh, but Matanyahu is close by, and actually it means the same, God gave, okay? So his father name is Matanyahu, and his private name is Akal, and he was important enough to have, to hold a seal that belongs to him and, you know, sign letters or contracts and so on. Um, that's one object, maybe connected to somebody who was active in the building. The second object is a bulla. This is the stamping that somebody does with the seal, so we don't have the actual seal. But the bulla is when you take a mud and you place it on a, you know, like, like you do with a wax uh, sealing of letters today. Today it's more like a game, but in antiquity this, this was used in order to sign letters, to make sure that the bags are not opened, rooms were sometimes sealed and, and locked with the bulla like that. Uh, when it's broken, it means something was open. And the bulla here says Natan Melech, okay, that's the private name of the person. The person before, Ikar ben Matanyahu, the son of Matanyahu, in the old world, you are nobody if you are not related to your family, to the larger uh, family. And that's why somebody is called Ikar ben Matanyahu. You are known because of your father. This person, Natan Melech, is probably famous enough that he doesn't need to write his father's name. Okay? Natan Melech, everybody knows who he is. And his title is Eved HaMelech the servant of the king, okay? And the servant of the king is not a servant in the way we understand it. It means a, a very high official uh, in the palace. A, like something like a, a, how do you call them? Civil servants today. Somebody who is a very a high official a minister within the palace uh, system of Judah. Uh, and this is probably why he's very famous. He's a high official. He doesn't need to mention his father's name. Natan Melech. It's nice to see how almost all the names here are the same. Natan Melech means also, uh, Melech means king, but in, in this sense, the Melech means also God. Okay, so, or king means also God. Um, so Natan Melech is God gave, just like Matanyahu and just like Netanyahu. Uh, and this person, if the seal is coming, if, if the bulla is coming with a letter from outside, then he's not related to the building where we are working, but it can be also related to him. And this person is also known from the Book of Kings. And in the Book of Kings, he's mentioned a, a, a person called Natan Melech Saris HaMelech. Saris is another word in Hebrew for a, a servant, for a slave. Uh, but again, it's not a slave, but it's a, a, it's a minister. And in the reform by Josiah, uh, Natan Melech is mentioned as a person who has a bureau, a lishka, uh, an office. And in, his, in this office, he has chariots or with the symbols of the sun. And Josiah, in his reform, is uh, burning them down. Uh, uh, I cannot prove to you by DNA that the Natan Melech that st stamped this Ebola and the Natan Melech that is mentioned in the Book of Kings are one and the same person. But I think we can be pretty sure about that. We, when we published it, we were blamed that we are too careful, that the chances that there are two uh, Natan Melech that were servant of the king are very slim, and we can be kind of sure that the stamp comes, that the Pula was stamped by him uh, and belonged to him, and this is connecting us straight to the biblical story. It also places us in the right time. Uh, Josiah ruled and is reformed. This is, brings us to 630. The building was destroyed in 586. The, the finds within the buildings are representing the decades before. This makes perfect sense that we are talking about the same Nathan Melech, I think. Room A, I think I will skip it. You see the entrance to Room A that I showed you before, and now you see the destruction. And this brings us to the story of the lab that uh, 
maybe that's what attracted, attracted your attention. I have two examples here and we'll go in a minute to the third example. Uh, on the, let's start with the right hand, uh, Johanna Regev. She's working for the Weizmann Institute uh, and she is uh, dating everything that we are digging, dealing with, uh, with C14, which is a dating method that is outside, uh, kind of outside of the archeology. span and we are, uh, we are using her expertise in dating olive pits and so on in order to give a date. But C14 doesn't really work because of physical problems with the destruction of 586. Uh, on the left hand, you see Nitsan Shalom, a PhD student of mine at Tel Aviv University, uh, who is writing her PhD on the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians and comparing different places where the destruction was found uh, within Jerusalem once uh, at Givati, like you see her here, in, in other places the, the destruction wasn't as severe, and her PhD is the reason why I said at the beginning, I'm not even sure that the destruction was complete, that the entire city was destroyed. But you'll see in a minute that I can be sure that this building was destroyed, and I think destroyed on purpose. Both of them are studying the section where you see all the collapse, and the burnt wood, and the burnt, uh, and the pottery, and so on. So this is uh, and for us archaeologists, a, a picture like that of the section uh, is like, this is what we hope for uh, every time we're working. And this is an article that we published already for, from her PhD in Hebrew, but we'll go into it later. And this brings us to paleomagnetism. Uh, uh, Johanna Regev, Nitzan Shalom, others that I didn't mention, these are all uh, students that we are saying to them, uh, uh, Jerusalem, the way we excavate it, this is a perfect lab for anybody who wants to do further studies, in-depth studies, uh, test uh, methods that are coming from other places, test the connection between uh, Bible and archeology, span whatever you want to do, our excavation uh, are the perfect place for that. I didn't mention, I'll say it in a second, we have a PhD that is being submitted now on food habits in Jerusalem from the Iron Age all the way to the days of Hasmoneans. Food habits are always, we think of them as mandan, we eat what we can, but actually they are very, very soaked with ideology. And I don't need to say a lot about kashrut and, and so on. Uh, so if somebody is studying the actual food habits of people in Jerusalem. Well, just to, just to clarify, kashrut is uh, kosher laws. Yeah, That's what sorry. kashrut is, no problem. <laughs> don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, sometimes my, the, I take it for granted that everybody lives with me in Israel. Um, so, uh, she's studying the bone remains of food that we are finding in tens of thousands within the excavations, and she's comparing how the food uh, habits changed through the years uh, when, Jer when Jerusalem exists. So that's another example of this lab system. And paleomagnetism is the moment where we, where we learn, we study it, but this time it worked the other way around. Paleomagnetism is a, a science in its, uh, in its uh, just beginning, okay, trying its roots trying to grow up. And what they need, the people that are dealing with the ancient uh, magnetism and the ancient north of the earth, uh, uh, what they need is places that we know exactly their date, okay? We know, I'll, I'll say it in general, I'm not a physician and I, I don't know these things in general. This is like, take it with a pinch of salt what I'm telling you now. But we, we, what we know for 2000 year, 200 years now is that the magnetic north of the Earth changes all the time. It changes in its direction and it changes in its magnitude. Sometimes it's stronger and sometimes it's weaker. Uh, the people that are trying to reconstruct the magnetic north of the Earth and how it changed are looking for places that have a kind of uh, recorded the magnetic north at a, mo at a certain moment. And they turned to archaeologists and they said, look, you're digging materials that were burnt. If the fire was high enough and the material holds enough uh, uh, metal within it, then these particles will free themselves from their moment of uh, creation where the magnetic north was, become fluid again, and freeze and record the moment of the fire. Okay, if you take soil and you make pottery, the soil has with it many grains and you mix it so the grains are like you see here in A, uh, directed to a random location. Then you put it in a kiln and the kiln has higher temperature, they, f they become fluid and they will freeze like the moment of the burning of the pottery. What you have here is the floor that I, saw, I showed you before 
And the guy who came to us, Yoav Vaknin, this is his picture, and I'll come back to here. Yoav and his uh, guides at the Hebrew University and the Tel Aviv University, uh, they said, if you know that this was burnt in 586, we want you to give us something that was burnt and you think that it's in, it's in situ, and then we will be able to know what the magnetic field of the Earth was at 586 BCE, and then let's say somebody excavates another site and he has no clear dating, he can relate to us as an anchor point, okay? So we are giving them data in order for them to establish a, a kind of a ruler that if enough data accumulates over the generation, over the years, then, and I think this is what I, I see it happening in my career, 10, 15 years from now, this will be the go-to system in order to date objects that you don't know their date, that you, you are you're kind of uh, puzzled with their date. You go and you say, ah, oh, this is like 586 in Jerusalem and not like 601 in Ashkelon where the Babylonian destroyed Jerusalem, uh, Ashkelon 20 years before, or Hazael destruction of uh, Philistine Gat at, at 820. So we are using the Bible here in order to uh, improve science. It's not that uh, the science proves the Bible, it's the other way around in this case. And this is amazing. And I was really thrilled with this project. And this is exactly what Yoav did. He took hundreds of samples from the floor and uh, we said that we think that the floor has collapsed. It was on fire, it collapsed, and then it froze in its location where it collapsed. And uh, what he tested is that you can, you can see it, you know, I think in this close up better, that every floor, every segment of the floor is pointing into a different direction. If they will all point in their magnetic north to the same, like you see here in, in the last layer, they will all be pointing to the same direction, no matter how they're lying. It means that the floor was on fire, collapsing and cooled down in the position that we are finding it now. And that's exactly what happened in the article that we published. It is clear that the whole floor was on high temperature. It, it's amazing floor. It has, uh, the plaster is well made. And because it was on the second floor, the beams failed, the beams that held it, that I showed you before, and it all collapsed while on fire and froze in this direction and gave us this anchor point of 586 uh, BCE. And you can see here, all of the green points are uh, the one that gave a, the one single direction uh, and means that they, they cool down in, the in their location. Some have moved because Earth moves through the years. But that's, that's an incredible uh, picture, uh, very unique. People that are dealing with uh, archaeomagnetism, usually they can narrow down into a decade or something like that. But we could tell them that this is 586, even if it's not the 10th of August or the 10th of Av, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's precise enough uh, for their work. For us, uh, for us, it's even more incredible. I'm sorry, I'll go back to the picture of where you see the, the floor itself, because it gives us another indication that the building was burnt, heavily burnt. And when you see a building that is made of stones and you know, it's, it's not easy to burn the building like that. If you come to a building and you just throw a torch and you move on, uh, probably the fire will not, you know, will not catch. It, it means that the, 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 the Babylonians wanted to burn this building, wanted to make sure that the building will burn and will collapse and gave, a, you know, place a lot of energy in order to ensure that. And the building did burn down and did collapse. And as Nitzan shows in her PhD, Nitzan Shalom, other buildings in other places did not burn down. So the feeling is that if we take the importance of this building as a bureau of somebody, you know, a high official in the, in, in the monarchy of Jerusalem, what we can understand is that when the Babylonians came in, they probably burned down the symbols, the buildings that were important, and they wanted to make sure that everybody sees them burning down. But domestic structures and other structures were simply abandoned or left un unharmed and so on and did not burn down. And this was a kind of a more selective declaration of destroying Jerusalem than an actual complete destruction of Jerusalem, something that did happen with the Romans much later on, that they, they did not leave one stone unturned when they destroyed the city. Okay, so for us, this, for us, this was an important information that goes past just what uh, Yoav is saying. 
the fact that we could say that the floor collapsed and everything was destroyed. Do I have a minute to go on into the, what's happening after the destruction? Uh, yes, you do. Okay. So everything was destroyed. The building was destroyed, and you saw the amount, the mass of stones. But we do see a Persian reuse of the destroyed building, not the entire building. Uh, in one place, we see a very simple, humble wall that was built, and then things on, on the floor itself. In another place, we see that they kind of cleared away some of the destruction and then placed their life up on top. But it seems that they are coming back to the same building. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, this, this is a location of one room that they are reusing. And you see here complete vessels from the Persian period. This is fifth century BCE. So we are 100 years later after the destruction. Uh, this, where the stick is, this is a location of a floor that we know uh, that the Persian have you reused. And this is the image of the destruction that I showed you before. So the amount of stones that were here, that was in, in, impossible for them to move. Okay, this, you need uh, uh, cranes from today and hundreds of working hours in order to move the amount of stones that is here. Uh, so they are living here, but the ruined building is just outside of their doors. Just so you know, you come out in the, in the morning and you see a ruin, okay? And now think of it, a person comes out, that's the image that he sees. If we, we speak about the father and son experience, then the father says to his son, now oh, you remember, this, this, is, this is Jerusalem, the, the you know, glorious Jerusalem as it was 100 years ago. This is what we are crying out about. So the memory wasn't just a vague idea that they read, they read in the book. The memory was very physical, was very... Uh, 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 physically located in their daily life. Okay? It wasn't just a, a story that you read in, in the books like, uh, like uh, for us today. And I think this image, this image of, of uh, Nehemiah in his night tour of Jerusalem, seeing how uh, destroyed it is, is talking about people that are coming from outside and seeing Jerusalem as, as, dist as a destroyed city. But I want you to, to think of people that are living here. They are not just uh, visiting or seeing, or they're not just coming for a kind of a, a visit or a pilgrim into the destroyed city. They, they are there within the destruction. And I think the, uh, with, with this image, you understand that Jerusalem, when it revived, and, and uh, I, I will not, this will take us to another place. We, we see that at one point, the area where we excavated has become an administrative center again. We find administrative objects from the Persian period and from the early Hellenistic period. So it's not just a, re a small revival of people that are living humbly. At one point, it becomes a revival of the center itself. Uh, but even in the days of the, when it became central, the, the destruction was still uh, within their lives. Whew. Thank you very much. I will stop. So just to, to conclude, because I know uh, Professor Godot has to deal with the kids at home. <laughs> 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 so I'm mindful that, you know, he has his wife, he has to make sure the kids are going to bed. Uh, I just want to really say thank you very much. As you see uh, on the screen right now, uh, the reason I believe this divine appointment with uh, Professor Godot happened is because what you see on the screen after five years of prayer of Christian professors who are, uh, who are young uh, in Christian universities teaching Bible and theology normally are, don't have access to what's happening on the ground and bringing it into the classroom. So you never know. Again, for me, I serve a greater calling of Jewish Christian relations. Who knew that we can actually do this like we're doing this today, sitting in a Zoom, listening to the verification of a Bible account. I remember almost 20 years ago when I would be the sole Jew representing uh, the Jewish people working at the Israeli consulate in New York for a night to celebrate Israel. And the, the fast forwardness of seeing more and more Christians coming out and putting Israel in, in their life and their calling is truly amazing. You're a testament to it. Um, everyone here I've met personally, have a personal friendship with you. Uh, some of you I've actually brought to Israel. Uh, so it's been, it's been really amazing journey. Uh, Dr. Godot doesn't really know the history 
of everything that's happened in my life, you should just know that you've now opened up a whole new chapter of how we're going to bring Israel into the classroom. Mm -hmm. So this recording today, these professors that you see right now are going to have this, this lecture of something that just popped up on the screen in the headlines two weeks ago. And just to see, to bring that into the classroom makes Israel alive. It's no longer fossilized. He's talking about the fossils of the past, but it's being done by today's Jewish sovereignty, its professors, both Jews and Gentiles who are living in the land, looking at the history. But we're verifying the biblical account. And so, Dr. Gadot, your, your work is sacred because for us that that really believe in the Bible and take, take it very serious, when we see a headline like this, it really enhances our faith and gives us more of an understanding of, of the context of it all. So I just want to say thank you for the years that you've put in taking these little coins and then gently brushing the, the dust away. Uh, no one really understands the tedious process of what goes into a dig. And maybe can, you, can, go ahead. Maybe can, I, can, can I throw out an idea here? Go ahead. Uh, we, we at the university work, uh, universities in Israel, we work with volunteers, students, volunteers, in uh, the work at Azeka. We are working with uh, students from uh, Heidelberg University. They are not archaeology students, they are theology students. Uh, we work with theology students because we think that there is a lot of com a common ground. And if anybody wants to bring us a group of students, not, not to appreciate the idea for a lecture, but to appreciate it through work. And uh, we are open <laughs> to any cooperation. No, no, that's right. And you should just know because mm -hmm. of coronavirus two usually there would be a bunch of excavations happening right now. At least 2000 students would be on site in the summertime, helping to excavate a lot of these sites, including the city of David. Unfortunately, <laughs> because of that, the entire operations have almost come to a standstill and there's a lot more work that's put on Dr. Godot's shoulders right now to fast forward things. So I just want you to understand the timing of it all. Literally, there's hardly any of the sites being excavated like they were once. And now two weeks ago, you have this amazing headline of the verification. And I just want you to, again, you're getting this news right now uh, on hand in real time. So again, Dr. Godot, Thank you for everything. I just want to thank, thank uh, again, God uh, for having this opportunity, your willingness to be part of this yes. uh, and trusting in the center under the auspices now of Rabbi Kenneth Brander, who's new chancellor of Oratory Stone. If you didn't know Rabbi Shlomo Riskin, who was the former chancellor and founder for Oratory Stone, retired in 2018. Uh, but Rabbi Kenneth Brander, who is the former vice president of Yeshiva University is now leading the way and he's made Jewish Christian relations the forefront of the vision going moving forward. Right now, I'm working on a curriculum to teach rabbis and Jewish women leadership on how to do Jewish Christian relations. So the path is amazing, but one of the proud moments that we have is the academics, the Christian academics willing to come to Israel and introduce another narrative into the classroom. So with that, everybody, thank you very much for being with thank us, you. Dr. Godot. Thank you very much. Blessings from from Israel.